sure are allowed this time of year. came. You're the third meeting I've had with a student in as many weeks. Uh, and you're the first one to show up without prodding and having to reschedule. Um, I'm sorry I was late, but I just came from another meeting. It's meeting hopping around here. was talking to Principal Wells, who I'm sure you've met. I had no interest in the uh, Machiavellian backroom plans and schemes and stratagems. Gossip. Slagging people off. I just want to teach. I want to teach and I want to take pictures. Those are my goals in life. What are yours? I mean, you've been in my class for a couple of months. You don't talk very much. Um, you're punctual, whatever that's worth. Woody Allen once said 90% of getting through life is just showing up, so you've got that down. But, you know, I, I don't know a whole lot about you. Um, look, you're you're at Blackwell. You uh, stride in these hallowed halls yeah. along with your peers. And, you know, if you're here, there's a reason you're here. And we have, I guess we have three types of students at Blackwell. Uh, we have those who are those who are extremely talented. Um, we have those who are extremely motivated. And I've seen quite a few of those. Motivated to a fault. Motivated uh, to the point of myopia. Tunnel vision. Dedication is not always a good thing. You know, there's taking it too far. And the third kind of student we have is a student who's rich. Let me grab your file, which I uh, got from Principal Wells. Mm. today's date, do you know? Uh. Every place else I've ever taught, my teachers had full access to students' files. This is the first school I've been at where you need to get special permission from the principal himself to look at a student's permanent record. All right, so you're not rich. Hmm. 
You're not a troublemaker. Um, you know, you're not uh, the example we want everyone to follow. Introverted. Uh, as I said, you don't talk much in class. Not much participation in uh, extracurricular activities. But that's all right. Artists do not need to be the life of the party. Mm. Your GPA is low, bottom 10%. You strike me as smart. Teachers have probably told you that your whole life. So, I know from your work, which I have in a folder that we'll look at in a little bit, um, that you're talented, so you're type one, you're not talent, you're not motivated, and you're talented, and you're not rich. Yeah, far from unique. Uh, I know you're a precious snowflake and everything, but uh, I've seen your type. Now the pictures of yours that I've seen are Remarkable. Uh, you know, assuming that you want to be a photographer, and God, I, I hope that's the case, because why else would you be here? You know, you'd be not only wasting your talent, but you'd be wasting everybody's time if that weren't the case. So let's uh, let's assume that's true for the moment. Um, if you have a desire to be a photographer, but you're not, you're not jumping through the hoops that we're asking you to, and I'm sure there's a reason for that. In fact, I can guess the reason. You feel as if it's a waste of your time to jump through hoops. You know what you want to do, and you have a decent idea of how to achieve it. So you don't see why you should spend the next three years here um, taking calculus and chemistry when all you want to do is shoot the cover of the next National Geographic. Uh, maybe the swimsuit issue. I'm playing devil's advocate to some extent here because I don't, uh, I don't totally disagree with you. you know, I, was, I was the same way. I was very withdrawn, very introspective, very sort of in my own world. Um, and it starts as a defense mechanism, but it becomes something uh, bigger, something grander. And I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it can be nurtured and it can be, uh, it's hard, you can harness it. Um, and it can take you far. But you do have to realize that other people can help you and that uh, advice is not worthless. Um, you know, the way I see it, you spend uh, three years of your life here some spend more. What do you get out of that? Right? Um, 
school like this, you know, you you get connections, but you're an introvert. You're not that social. Uh, I imagine you will get a few close friends out of your time here, um, but you're not going to be voted most popular. And uh, if we had fraternities or sororities, you wouldn't be in one. Um, so what? So if you're spending that amount of time doing something, learning something, um, you need to get that time back later in life. Um, if your time here doesn't net you more time down the road, then this is a waste of time. Um, at the end of your life, I should say at the end of your professional career, if you haven't gained by being here, then you're right, you shouldn't be here. And that's what I see my goal as. Um, you know, if you're going to be a professional photographer, I want to give you, uh, you know, an extra 5% of keepable photos from the millions you will take in your life. I want to show you the dead end roads and the cul-de-sacs that I went down uh, to save you that time. And I want to show you techniques and um, tricks, for lack of a better word, that will inspire you. that will uh, motivate you to try things that you didn't even know that you could try. And hopefully those will get you somewhere. Um, before I talk too much more about this, I'd, I'd like to just grab your folder. You can uh, go over your work and uh, I reviewed it uh, yesterday, but I'd like to go over it again with you here. And we kind of see where you are, where you're headed, and how we can get you where you want to go. Okay. Don't move. four students, these folders I have out. Of whom I have meetings with, or had meetings with, in the coming weeks, past few weeks. I don't have your name on here yet, but I'll remedy that. You have a, a, a broad swath of interests. Um, your subject matter is diverse, that's good. You don't limit yourself to just one kind of photograph. I see a lot of these folders with just portrait photography, or just landscapes. And excellent eye for composition and that's something that's really hard to teach that's one of the more abstract concepts you know 
there are elements of it, don't get me wrong, that are, broadly speaking, right and wrong. Um, but uh, the finer points are um, tough to teach. Kind of either grok it or you don't. Yeah, so to some extent, uh, the way a photographer sees the world can be interpreted through the photographs that he or she takes. And this is a pretty limited cross section of uh, your photographs, but I'm getting an idea. And it pretty much just uh, reinforces what I thought before. You you seem to have a way of looking at the world, and that's important. You need to have a vision. Um, you have a flair for composition, and you have a broad uh, swath of interests. As far as subject matter goes, those are all uh, points in your column. But it's painfully obvious to me looking at those photos that you're lacking in some of the more technical areas. Um, your exposures were all off. You know, there was blurring and artifacting and high ISO where there didn't need to be, and uh, you know, your shutter speed was not right. And, these are basic things, you know, the, really the sort of three pillars of photography, aperture, shutter speed, ISO, you know, those are the, uh, those are the sort of three variables, uh, you know, not including focal length, which is slightly less variable, generally, unless you're using a zoom, um, but those are the things that need to be able to maximize to get what you want out of a given photo. And, you know, unlike composition and a lot of other things about photography, it's not really an art to those things. It's, that's more of a craft. That's more of a, uh, here are the results. Here's, here's sort of the effects of doing this. Um, you know, do what is gonna work best for a given situation, learn how to recognize what those situations are, and you're good to go. If you're breaking any of those rules, you're doing so intentionally. And there's a big difference between um, breaking a rule that you know and getting a good result, and breaking a rule that you don't know and getting a good result. Because even with that good result, um, if you didn't knowingly uh, color outside the lines, um, then you don't really own that, you know? That was a mistake. It could be a good mistake. It could make you money, right? But it's hard to claim that it was yours. You know, um, I know, especially in the age of digital photography, it's sort of a, a quantity market, you know? Take thousands of pictures and hope that for every thousand, there are 10 or 20 that are good. Like I said, I want to try and get your percentage up and, you know, it's no secret. I'm sure you know um, some of my history and sort of what I do and what I've done in the course of my career you know, over these last 20 some odd years. I'm not a huge fan of digital photography. You know, although lately I've been coming around, technology is finally getting to the point where it's not that I can't tell the difference. I can tell the difference between a camera or a photo taken on a digital camera, mirrorless or a DSLR, 
and one that was taken and developed on analog film, I can tell the difference. Um, but it's getting to the point where it's almost just a matter of preference, whereas up until very recently, it was just worse, I think empirically worse. And now it's more just a, is this a look I want? You know, the grain has become more organic. Um, obviously the megapixels are way up there. Uh, so it's not a, a, it's not a resolution issue, but there is an aspect of digital photography that's, um, I'm afraid is here to stay. Um, regardless of how far technology comes. And in fact, partially because of how far technology has come, there's an aspect of, you know, I, I, I don't mean to be rude, but, uh, would you like a Tic Tac? Yeah. I kind of think you need one. These are fruit adventure Tic Tacs. Yeah. Uh, when I was a kid, they only had one flavor of Tic Tac. Mint. Spearmint, I think. They didn't even have, like, peppermint. Now they have all kinds of flavors. Uh, I'm not holding against you, but, you know, um, as I said before, you know, there are students here who are very dedicated to their craft. Um, but you shouldn't be dedicated to the point where you neglect hygiene, for example. Do you have a preference flavor? I don't really know what they are. Green, yellow, orange, and red. I assume that's cherry, lemon, lime, orange. Green it is. You're welcome. Where was I? I was talking about digital photography, wasn't I? Yeah, so, um, the, uh, the technology has gotten to the point where it's acceptable in my eyes to use a digital camera for professional photography, uh, professional artistic digital photography. Drop the digital, just photography. Um, but it introduced an element that is here to stay. Uh, and that element is, is a change in the process change in the way of thinking for the vast majority of photographers. Now, what I'm talking about is, um, seems like a good thing on the surface of it, but it's uh, choice, really a, an orgy of choice. Um, there's so much that you can do in digital photography, uh, in post-production, that you don't have to make any choices when you're taking a picture. You just kind of, um, you, know, you shoot raw, and you shoot as flat as possible, and you make sure everything is lit three-point lighting, everything is nice and sterile, and it's pavilion, it's... What you end up with is, is mediocrity, you know, because you're, again, you know, you're shooting for quantity, and you're shooting for, in the hopes that in post-production, you can go in there and make some magic, you know, in Photoshop or whatever you're using. Um, 
and you know the, that connection with the end product and that's something that was lost and you really felt it with film you I mean you when you're in the dark room you you smell it you know you you feel it you, you know, hopefully you have gloves on but you know you you're right in there you got the chemicals on your hands and you know you're holding the negatives and you're you know it's it's uh, tactile and it's palpable um, and it's deliberate you know um, digital photography is anything but deliberate now um, you know you don't you don't even have to have you know I said you had vision that's great but with digital photography a lot of times you don't have to have vision anymore and and that's a shame you know with analog film you had to know where you were going or you didn't have a hope of getting there with digital photography it's more like just drive in a direction and you're going to get somewhere and we're going to retroactively kind of uh, make it seem like this is where you meant to go in the first place even though you had no idea where you were going um, you, know, you take a thousand pictures into the most powerful software that we have nowadays and coupled with the technology to capture those images in raw you can change your exposure you can change anything and um, it can be a paralytic you know that much choice I prefer uh, working with film I still do you know um, even in the course of my career even back in the 90s it was nothing like this nothing this is a this is a very recent um, change and it's a sea change it's um, it's never going to be the same again um, but yeah even back in the 90s you know, we still had to uh, plan and everything that I shot was analog anyway, you know. Uh, but what post-production was for me was a safety net. Um, it was a, a just in case I really screwed up, you know. Uh, it was not part of the intended workflow. Uh, it was not, you know. There were cases where it was, right? But by and large, it was not. Um, it was to handle the unforeseen. Um, whereas now, it's, it's a part of everybody's workflow. And, you know, uh, third-party plugins and uh, presets mean that a lot of people's photographs are just kind of uh, converging into one look, that sort of teal and orange look. Um, it's a great look, but you know, not when everybody has it. To a lesser extent, I feel the same way about uh, digital manipulation. You know, the point of photography is to capture a moment of reality that happened and then put some kind of um, some kind of artistic brand on it that allows the viewer to interpret it uh, in a different way or to see the moment of realness in a different way kind of think about things you know photography is not um, painting you know it's not drafting it's not drawing um, I feel like if you don't start with something real, even if you take it somewhere else, right? If you don't start with something real, then you, photography loses its uh, the aspect of it that makes it a unique art. At that point, you, you should be a painter, right? which takes a lot of talent to be a painter, arguably more talent than it takes to be a photographer. Certainly more than it takes to be a mediocre photographer. At this point, anybody can be a mediocre photographer. The barrier for entry is mostly money. And
clients. It's not the way it should be, but there you are. That's where we're at. Whew. I derailed. Sorry about that. <laughs> so we can bring this back around. I don't want to take up your entire evening. But I did want to go over sort of some of the fundamentals with you. Uh, hopefully I won't go off on too many tangents. But, you know, I kind of want to go over what's what you should be carrying with you, um, you know, and the things that have helped me and sort of the basics on how those things work. Because like I said, based on some of the work that we just looked at, um, there are some fundamentals that you need a little bit of boning up on. So where do we start? We start with the camera, right? That is your tool. That is, uh, literally the lens through which you will see the world. Um, and you have to know it inside and out. You have to know it, I want to say better than you know yourself, but that just sounds stupid. Um, but it's true. <laughs> but I'm not going to say it, because it sounds stupid. <laughs> so, uh, let's start with the camera. So this camera I'm going to show you is one that I used quite a bit over the course of my career. Now it's a 35 millimeter camera. Uh, it's rather stock. It's from the 70s. Um, it's called the Walls Electric. And the only thing electric about it is the flash. Uh, other than that, it's a standard wind, take a picture kind of camera, take your standard 35 millimeter film, why do I like this camera? It's very hard to say, um, there's something about the images it produces, uh, they're not the sharpest. You know, they're not the cleanest, um, but there's a character to them that I like very much. So I use this camera a lot. The viewfinder is horrible. Um, you know, arguably the lenses, or the, the lens that comes on it is not that good. Uh, it's sort of a standard FD mount, you can remove the lens. Uh, but let's go over sort of the parts, right? So. Uh, what is on here right now is a sort of standard 50 millimeter lens. Uh, it's got an f-stop of 1.8. So I'm going to assume you know what f-stop means. Um, you know the difference between f-stop and t-stop. Um, at the very least you know lower means faster. And you know fast means the amount of time it takes to get light from the front plane of the lens to the image plane, which on most cameras is denoted by a little. See if we can see that. It's a little circle with a line through it. It denotes where the image plane on the camera is. So yeah, uh, the lens has shutter speed on it has ASA or ISO on it, and it has focus on it. Three separate rings here. And you can hear the difference when I take a picture with the shutter speed at, say, 1 30th of a second, 1 8th of a second, and a full second. That uh, sounded like it was longer than a second. It's possible that the mechanism is uh, losing its uh, tension. Just getting, it's an old camera. 
So right, Let's see what else is there. I mean, like I said, it takes 35 millimeter film. It's really a basic camera. There's not a whole lot to it. Um, oh, you know what? I just remembered. Uh, do you mind if I take a couple of pictures of you really quick for your folder? I gotta load it first. photo. I don't know what happened to it. It's just good to have, you know, I put out sort of a flyer near the end of the semester. It's just good to have a photo of everybody in the class. set. Now in this light, obviously I don't need a long shutter speed. And like I said, this viewfinder is worthless for anything other than framing the subject. Uh, it's not going to give me any information on ISO or light in the scene or anything. Uh, even focus. That does tell me focus, but not really well. Okay, ready? Longer shutter speed and lower ISO. Portrait. Good. Thanks. So why don't we talk a little bit about lenses? Now that camera that I showed you there was had a 50 millimeter 50 millimeter lens on it. This is another 50 millimeter lens. This is a uh, a Canon FD lens. It's also an old lens. This lens is from the 80s. Um, but you can see it's got, you know, uh, manual aperture. Uh, and it's got the focus ring and the aperture readings. Now, I don't know what lens you're using or what camera you're using for that matter. Um, but you should have a good 50 millimeter lens in your bag at all times. Uh, they're cheap because they were produced in such huge numbers and they're relatively simple um, as far as the number of lens elements goes and the, the way the glass is ground. Um, so they're inexpensive. Uh, they call them nifty 50s. And since they're a prime lens, you can get a pretty good f-stop on them pretty cheaply. So this is a f1.8. Um, you know, that should be, the, if, you, if we're talking about 50 millimeter or 35 millimeter, your lens should be f1.8 or lower. Now, 
you know, lower than f1.8, you start getting much more expensive, much more bulky uh, very, very quickly. So like this, like I said, is a 50 millimeter uh, 1.8. And right over here, this is a 50 millimeter 1.2. Uh, and this is probably at least twice as heavy as this one. Um, but you know what a low f-stop will do for your images, right? You'll have much more light hitting the image plane uh, or the film. And because that collects more diffuse light, it narrows your depth of field. And if you look at the world around you as a coordinate system, with Y being up, X being across, and Z being towards you, uh, a smaller slice of Z will be in focus uh, the lower your f-stop is because it's a bigger hole. So more light gets in it. That means more diffuse light gets in it. And that means your image becomes diffuse. Very important. It's very important to keep your lenses clean. Um, you know, I recommend Something like this here. It's just a Zeiss lens cleaning fluid. You know, it's 99.999% water. Uh, but you pay for that 0. 0.000001% something else. Isopropanol? Doesn't have a ingredient list but you know you want to be sure that your lenses are clean not just when you're using them not just when you're taking pictures I mean it's obvious if you're taking pictures with a lens and you have dirt on it um, it's possible that you're gonna uh, muddy the image you know probably you won't even notice it depending on how much dirt there is uh, but more importantly any kind of particulate matter on a lens has the potential to scratch it so you want to make sure that your lens is clean, not just when you're taking pictures, but when you put them away. And you just kind of spray them. And you want to have a microfiber cloth that you can wipe them down with, which I know I have here. I probably should have found it before I sprayed it. Such is the lot of the impractical artist. Here we go microfiber cloth, lens, circular motion. And voila, clean lens. Let's see what else we have here. This is something I always kind of carry too. Uh, this is a loop. And this one is made for digital cameras. Show you on this camera here. So you see on this camera, the screen on the back, which could use a cleaning as well. Um, in sunlight, it's very hard to see uh, this screen. And it's not always feasible to uh, put your eye up to the viewfinder. So it's good to have a loop that you can put over the screen. And then you can just put that against your eye and you're actually looking at the loop. That screen acts as sunshade, magnifies the image a little bit. Uh, and you can adjust focus if you're wearing glasses or not wearing glasses, take off your glasses, what have you. So if you're using a digital camera, one of these is uh, 
very important. Along the same lines as keeping your lenses clean, uh, I also always make sure that my lenses have a UV coating on them. You can see the transmission on this. It's pretty spectacular. It's pretty much just 100% clear. But uh, this will prevent a small rock or whatever it is that might get kicked up, might damage your lens. It's better that it damages this. Uh, I don't really use it for the UV coating, I just use it to protect the lens. And of course I always carry a variable ND filter. And what this does is you just turn it and it goes from uh, I think one stop to six stops of light. And of course what this allows you to do is shoot on a bright day outside your aperture open all the way so you get a nice narrow depth of field you pop this on the lens and you won't be blowing out your highlights or overexposing very useful as well I also always carry a flashlight you just never know when you're gonna need it so I recommend doing that as well and this is a big one duct tape you can use this to do everything and anything. Um, I can't even go into the number of uses that it has. They're myriad, they're legion. Okay. But you will find a lot of uses for it. So I'll just make sure to have at least a roll on hand with you at all times. Now, um, you know about focal lengths, I assume. Um, you, know, you have your standard 50 millimeter portrait lens, uh, and then you have your medium telephotos. Actually, 50 millimeter is a medium telephoto, uh, and your actual telephotos, and you have your wide angle, and you have your fisheye. So this is a Takina 11 to 16 millimeter. This is what they call ultra wide. It's not quite a fisheye, uh, but it's wider than most wide angles, which I think are like 16 uh, to 30 or 16 to 28. Uh, and you can see the elements are very spherical. Um, now, why do people use 50 millimeter lenses or 85 millimeter lenses for portraiture as a rule? A couple reasons. Um, you know, people are uncomfortable if you get a camera right up in their face. You want them to be natural. You want to feel some space between them and you. Um, the further away you are from the camera, the more compressed space becomes. Uh, the closer you are to the camera, the more um, distorted uh, perspective uh, makes things look like they're further apart from each other. Perspective appears to be changing uh, at a higher incidence than it does when you're further away. Um, this is why filmmakers will use a telephoto lens uh, when they're doing a shot of someone punching someone else because it helps eliminate that space between people. Uh, that if they were very close up, it would be very pronounced. Um, some people think that a uh, wide angle lens actually distorts features. That's not strictly true. It's actually the distance from the camera that distorts features, but really, we're getting into semantics there because if you have an ultra-wide angle lens on your camera, uh, 
you're gonna have to get pretty close to get the same framing as you would from a distance with something like this 50 millimeter. Um, and by doing that, by getting close to your subject, you're gonna introduce those distortions that you see in videos where it looks like something is you know, coming at you um, in a sort of fisheye Alice in Wonderland style. Um, So, I mean, those are the basics that I wanted to go over, uh, more or less. Um, you know, I assume you use an interchangeable lens camera. It looked like it from what I saw. Um, you know, always be taking pictures. Uh, and that's different from uh, taking a lot of pictures of the same thing in the hopes that quantity uh, outweighs talent in framing and choosing your shots. Uh, you need to always be putting yourself in new situations and doing different things um, and seeing what comes out of it and learning. And you know, I hope that your time in this class uh, will show you some of those things and show you some of those shortcuts uh, so that you don't have to spend so much, quite so much time exploring um, non-productive avenues. I gotta go back and talk to Wells soon. There's all kinds of weird things happening at this school. You wouldn't believe me if I told you. A lot of opportunities for good photographs. A lot of opportunities for art and um, a meaningful, lasting effect. It's a lot of opportunities to change the future. How are you feeling? Noticed you haven't blinked in a while. I'm wondering if the paralytic took hold. Yeah, it seems to have. Well then. You're not alarmed. Tic Tacs myself, but you shouldn't take candy from strangers. This part is unpleasant.
gloves are just a precaution. I'd say don't be alarmed, but you probably already are. sure how long the effects of the paralytic will last. I need to act quickly. See you in the dark room.